Uh, thank you very much indeed, Paul. Can I just say how excited I am to be here? It's just so brilliant to see June, to see Martin, to see Ben, the old team reunited. And I'll tell you what, the team have done such a brilliant job, haven't they? Look at this. This really means that we mean business and it's time to let's make Britain great. So I just want to go back because, uh, as they say, or uh, as this expression goes, a week is a very long time in politics. So runs that very famous maxim, of course, attributed to Prime Minister Harold Wilson in the 1960s. Now, it's 365 days since we last met. So how would you describe the last year since we met? Incessant, wearisome, unceasing, unending, probably all of the above. Let me tell you, it has been quite a year. Let me just remind you of a few key points that have happened over the last year. First of all, you may remember this man. He was called Boris Johnson. Do you remember him? He was the Prime Minister. He had a very sizable majority of 80 members of Parliament. Now, if you have a majority of 80 members of Parliament, you can do fantastic things. You can really help this country. You can get people back on their feet again. But of course, he wasted all of that capital. And it went horribly wrong, didn't it? It went horribly wrong with Partygate, that political scandal, when he was involved in parties and other gatherings taking place, and crucially, whilst those public health restrictions prohibited them. Now, Boris Johnson said that all of the rules had been followed, and Downing Street denied that a party had taken place, if you recall. Uh, but then, of course, there was that infamous video of Allegra Stratton, who was the Downing Street press secretary, joking, joking about having parties in Downing Street at a time of national crisis, at a time when people were seriously ill and dying. And then, of course, more allegations surfaced in January of this year, since we last met, and reports emerged of a drinks party on the 20th of May 2020 in the garden of Number 10 Downing Street during that very first lockdown, the lockdown they imposed on all of us, the lockdown that destroyed lives and businesses. And Johnson then said he attended, he apologised for doing so, and then Downing Street had to apologise to Her Majesty the Queen for two events on the 16th of April 2021. And if you remember, that was the day before Prince Philip's funeral. This was in a third national lockdown. These people were meant to be in charge and setting an example. And they couldn't even have the ability to pay respect to Prince Philip. Well, Sue Gray undertook a report into uh, what happened and concluded, and very categorically actually, that senior political and civil uh, service leadership must bear responsibility for the culture. Well, we all know what happened. Boris Johnson's support plummeted. Local elections were a disaster for the Tories. And of course, two by-elections fell, Wakefield to Labour and the Lib Dems to Tiverton and Honiton. Now, I have to say that actually, in the time, we also have witnessed something quite remarkable, which is the fastest COVID vaccine rollout in Europe. It really was a triumph of medicine, really a triumph of medicine and logistics and political will. It was extraordinary. And of course, since we last met, the boosters were given. But what did they do? What were the collateral effects of what they did with the lockdowns and forcing people to have vaccines? The true damage of those national lockdowns has since become apparent, and it makes me very angry indeed. Lives were destroyed. Businesses have been destroyed across the United Kingdom. And elderly people were left alone, isolated, and frightened. And the most shocking part for me as a doctor is they did not think this through. They discharged people from hospital without testing them for COVID and put them, uh, discharged people uh, from hospital without testing them for COVID, putting them into residential homes. And that meant that they then spread COVID to the most elderly and the most vulnerable members of our society. And many of those elderly people, if you remember, couldn't have anyone to visit. And they died 
alone and very, very frightened. I think it's unforgivable. The vaccination rollout to children was introduced a year ago for 12 to 15 year olds and in January of this year it was extended to 5 to 11 year olds. Why? Why? There is no evidence at all that we should be vaccinating children. Covid is a self-limiting illness on the most part and the data on the benefits of vaccination to children are thin or really non-existent. You may also remember that the furlough scheme was introduced for 11.7 million people. It cost over 60 billion pounds, but it ignored 1 million small businesses. Those businesses really, really struggled as a result. They had to take bounce back loans, huge amounts of money that they are still repaying. Many of those SMEs actually went to the wall because they couldn't afford to pay the money back. The toll of those repayments was just too much for those very hardworking people. And there was evidence of fraud on an unprecedented scale. But it gets worse because the Conservative Party has always prided itself on being the party of fiscal responsibility. But is it? Well, the answer, quite frankly, is no. We have the highest tax burden in the last 70 years. There have been 400 tax rises in the last 10 years, and inflation knocking around 10%. Interest rates, as we all know, have skyrocketed, and we saw another 0.5% increase to 2.25%. And let me remind you, this is the highest level in 14 years, and the seventh rate rise uh, in a row as the bank has tried to tame soaring prices. I keep saying this repeatedly. The Bank of England has really one job to do, and if I was marking its homework, I would give it minus 10 for what it has actually done. It didn't do it well, it was too slow to act. And then of course, last week the government announced a mini fiscal event, definitely not a budget, nothing to see here, no, 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 and of course they had completely misjudged the mood. The markets got spooked, there was no analysis by the OBR, and as we know, chaos absolutely ensued. The pound then sunk to a record low against the dollar. The markets, well, they went into free fall. And the Bank of England had to take emergency action to stabilize the currency. They were actually selling gilts, then they were buying gilts. No one really knew what was going on, and no one was really in control. Hundreds of mortgage products were pulled as lenders panicked. And as one leading business luminary commented, these spending plans are completely nuts and could bankrupt the country in the next two years. Now, where was the Chancellor? Where was the Prime Minister? We didn't see them for days. And then Kwasi Kwarteng appeared looking like a mole blinking in the sunlight, actually very concerned and confused why everyone was so upset. And the Prime Minister was notably absent. This was a classic example of the Lady Bird book of my first government, how not to run a government. <laughs> but Richard and I have discussed this at great length. Borrowing, borrowing to fund tax cuts is really not very bright. It's not fiscal discipline. And the worst thing about this is those tax cuts are actually not targeted. Instead of cutting that 20p rate to 19p, which by the way makes most people about £170 better off, why don't they adopt a Reform UK policy? Take those who earn under 20,000 out of tax completely. Help those who are really struggling to actually afford to live. We are in the middle of a cost of living crisis. As part of my day job, I talk to a lot of people who are very, very worried about where this country is headed. You know, I've heard from people who are choosing between heating and eating. I heard from an elderly man who lives in one room with a one bar electric fire, who does not have any hot food and who doesn't bath or shower. He is so worried about the cost of living in this country in this year. That is unacceptable. And the great irony is people can't even afford to fill up their cars to go to work to earn the money. That again is unacceptable. 
Now, obviously, we've had a war in Ukraine, and of course, there are, there are pressures on the energy market. But actually, the problems are far deeper and go far further back. We have no concerted energy strategy in this country. And that is due to an abject failure of successive governments over the last few years. We haven't built a single new nuclear power station in this country since 1995. Why? It is a shocking indictment of the country that invented nuclear power. We split the atom here in the United Kingdom and we built the very first civilian nuclear power plant. It is a disgrace, it's shocking and it's total mismanagement. There has been no long-term planning. And Reform UK has been there constantly saying, right, things have to change. We have been campaigning for fracking. We need to have short-term energy supply in this country to help people with their energy bills. And we have been telling government time and time again they must reverse their decision on fracking. We believe there's something like one to two trillion pounds of energy sitting underneath our feet. The government resisted, the opposition resisted, but finally the government has agreed it needs to go ahead. But there is a caveat, and it can go ahead with local consent. That is not good enough. This is a national crisis. We need to ensure fracking is part of a wider energy mix and we suggest that those people who allow fracking should then get free energy as a result of actually agreeing to that fracking. Now, when you look at our planning, it is a total mess. Large road schemes take five to seven years of planning. Why? Wind farms have been taking 13 years to get off the ground. And they have only just decided right now to actually build at Sizewell C near me in Suffolk. That is a nuclear power station. It has taken decades of delay. It's incompetence, it's, it's ineffectual, it's just rudderless. The whole thing is rudderless. And why do we still not have a third runway at Heathrow? I thought we were going to make the best of Brexit. And that is what I and all of my uh, colleagues in the European Parliament fought so hard for. So we have squandered the opportunities that we delivered by getting that vote for Brexit. I want to say something very quickly about hospitals. I'm going to be talking about that this afternoon. Hospital waiting lists are a mess. The government will tell you 6.8 million people are waiting for elective procedures. That is totally wrong. We believe it's something like 12 to 15 million people are waiting for elective procedures on the NHS. GP services, I don't know if you've tried to see a GP recently. You can't. In July, 4 million people were waiting to see a GP. They had to wait over two weeks to see a GP. That is unacceptable, and that is why public satisfaction with the NHS is now at an all-time low. Well, Boris Johnson may well be out of office, but then, of course, the Conservatives decided that the country wasn't in such a bad state after all, and they embroiled on months of navel-gazing with their leadership contest, and it left complete political paralysis and, of course, a rudderless country desperate for help. They have a leader now. We also have a new monarch. And the problems that they have ignored for a very long time have got worse. The chickens have very much come home to roost. And to quote Mary Poppins, in short, we have a ghastly mess. The country is rudderless, it's presided over by incompetent leaders, and the government is chaotic and it's out of control. And that's where we come in. Because Reform UK has been making waves, slow and sure progress throughout the last year. We've constantly highlighted uh, where the government, where the opposition have been going wrong. And actually, Richard Paul and I talk about this a great deal, which is that uh, the really frustrating thing is that almost all of the policies that we announce have eventually been stolen by the government and enacted. And in many ways, that is a vote of confidence in the sound policies and philosophy of Reform UK. It is a clear endorsement of what 
we're doing. But let me remind you what we've actually talked about. We talked about the cost of energy crisis way before anyone else did. We talked about the solutions to it, and we called for the end to the fracking ban, as I said. Richard's been at the forefront calling for lower taxes, for zero waiting lists. Why are we waiting for an operation? Unacceptable, needs to go. We've been calling for cheaper energy. And we have got this mantra and we have consistently said, low tax, simple tax equals high growth. And they've ignored us until now. If you notice with the mini fiscal event, it's very much based on Reform UK's policies. I wouldn't have done some of it, but essentially they've realized that actually what we do need to move to is a low tax, simple tax economy, and we will then get growth. And they've ignored all our plans about the NHS uh, we need to liberate capacity in the hospital system. We need to train doctors. 40,000 nurses left the service last year. And even if we're now uh, getting more nurses back into the system, we're only just about even as a result of the numbers who are leaving. I'll talk about that a little more this afternoon. And that is why Reform UK is so important. And the really good news is our message is getting out there. People are listening. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, Richard, our great leader, and I now have shows on Talk TV. Uh, I do weekend breakfast between 7 and 10 on Saturdays and Sundays, and Richard does Sundays from 10 until 1. And I'll tell you what, it is a really great opportunity to engage with the audience, to hear uh, real feedback, actually, from people who are struggling to hear from callers, to listen to stories, and it's a real place where we can engage in political dialogue. And there is, make no mistake, a real sense of change in the air. More and more people are deserting the two main parties and they are looking for an alternative. And that alternative is Reform UK. Have a look at this. Hello, a very good morning to you. It's just after seven o'clock on Saturday, September the 24th. Yes, it's the weekend. Hooray, hooray, hooray. You've made it this far. So thank you very much indeed for joining me this morning. I have to tell you, it is very dark outside, very depressing when you get up at 3.30 in the morning and it's absolutely pitch black and it's only going to get worse as the winter mornings uh, start later and later. Well, I have to say, it is extraordinary to believe that uh, obviously the funeral of uh, Queen Elizabeth was only on Monday and that politics only resumed some four days ago after that uh, extraordinary occasion. What I find even more amazing is don't fear because yes of course they've done four days work and certainly we saw the mini budget this fiscal event which was unleashed yesterday but don't fear of course they've all gone into recess again uh, so that means they're not doing any work once again how do you view that outrageous shambolic self-indulgent you decide what i do think is that it's very nice work if you can get it I've been, this was bold and when you look at the newspapers it depends which paper you read but i mean the telegraph saying quartan gambles on the biggest tax cuts in half a century we've got the eyes saying the pound is plunging at last, I quite like this one, the Daily Mail, at last a true Tory budget. So some papers very much in favour. Well, you know, let's just, before we talk about the budget, let's just go back 12 years. For the last 12 years, we've had Treasury orthodoxy yeah. determining how the economy is run. And it's got us into a big mess. So the first thing to say about the budget is, thank goodness, orthodoxy has been chucked out of the window. And as you say, that was not a mini budget. In 30 <laughs> minutes, I had a 10 o'clock meeting for which I had to get out of my office. And in 30 minutes, um, you know, Quartain just changed. The world changed. Yeah. And said that Mr. Roman drove a coach and horses through electoral laws and did not care. He was accused of personation of postal votes and at ballast stations. And this is why, this is why voter ID at elections is so essential and why I'm delighted that it has now been passed in the Elections Act of 2022. It's already used in Northern Ireland and dramatically reduced the risks of personation. Now, I should say, Mr. Rahman, of course, denied all the allegations. He was not convicted in a criminal court. 
But it does seem to me remarkable that anybody essentially found guilty by the electoral court of those illegal practices should be allowed to stand again. Have finally, after 12 years, thrown, thrown me teddy out the pram <laughs> and I am no longer going to vote Conservative. I've wow. actually even joined, I've even joined Reform. Have you? Um, OK, great. I have. I have because I am sick to death of them keeping promising me stuff and never doing it. They have been talking about immigration, they have been talking about crime, they have been talking about Brexit sort of half done. For since since 2010 and nothing has changed yeah. nothing yeah. and you can't i'm just not willing to just keep voting these people in when they don't do anything so as you can see things really are changing i really do get the sense that people are willing to vote for an alternative and that is why there is so much to play for make no mistake Elections are coming and they're coming very quickly. They may come quicker than we even imagine, but those elections will be with us in the next 24 months. Politics has never been in such a turbulent state and Reform UK is in a pivotal place to succeed. The future is bright. The future is bright blue. The future is Reform UK.